Welcome to another episode of the Work Hard, Play Hard podcast. My name is Rob Murgatroyd, and each week on this podcast, I talk to some of the most fascinating people on the planet in all areas of life, from mindset to fitness to spirituality, and of course, business. Look, I believe you deserve success in all the areas of your life, not only business. But before we get into today's show, you may want to join us on our next Work Hard, Play Hard experience. This year, we're going to be going to Mykonos and Marrakesh. In these experiences, I have hand-selected a group of high-performing business people who are seeking more balance, connection, and they want to celebrate their wins as a reward for the hard work that they put in. If you want someone to curate once-in-a-lifetime experiences and force you to play more, rush over to workhardplayhardexperience.com. Fill out an application so we can jump on a discovery call to see if this is a good fit for you. And remember, excuses are over. It's time to live. Because when you spend 12 to 13 hours a day thinking eight moves ahead, and then six, seven o'clock at night hits and everyone goes, okay, turn that off now. It's not that easy. If I told you there's a 73% chance when you leave your house today, you're gonna get hit in the head with a bowling ball, you wouldn't go out. You would stay in or at least wear a helmet, but people still get married. The more fascinating statistic to me though is that 87% of people who get divorced are remarried within five years of their divorce. The upper echelon of divorce lawyers we're kind of like, you know, like the matrimonial mafia. We're like the five families, you know, like we need each other. We have a respect for each other and it can be a real shorthand. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Work Hard, Play Hard show. Today on the show is James Sexton, who is one of the most sought after divorce attorneys in New York City. Now, why do I have a divorce attorney on this podcast? The reason why I wanted to have him on the show is to talk about ways that couples can mitigate their chances of ever winding up in his office. And this episode really is about life and ways that you can have a deeply fulfilling relationship with your partner. James has a couple of books that really discuss from a divorce lawyer's perspective, a completely new way to think about relationships. And James has an ability to communicate his point in a way that sort of like takes you on a mental ride in the same way that a finely tuned comedian with a tight set can do. You know, he'll, he sort of like teaches you without you even know that it's happening. You'll know what I mean when you listen to. So with that long intro, please enjoy this conversation with James Sexton. James, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here, Rob. You know what, man? I got to tell you. So... I learned about you through my good, dear friend, and we actually are good, dear friends for a long time, Lewis House. Great guy. And well, a great guy. Great guy. We were in uh, Greece together and we had a conversation where we were talking about relationships and stuff like that. And he said, yeah. you know, I learned, I learned a lot about relationships through a divorce lawyer. And I said, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. He's, yeah. Like, he's like, well, who knows better than him? And I was like, you know what? You're right. Yeah. So I think a good place to start is with really something that's happening in real time. So we got started a little bit late today because you had a client emergency. And then yeah. we started, when I hit, re, right before I hit record, you said yeah. she tried to weaponize coronavirus. Yeah. Maybe you can unpack that just a yeah. little bit. No, I mean, what I'll tell you is I, I had a conversation with a buddy uh, many years ago as a criminal defense lawyer. And uh, he was saying to me, you know, how he represents, you know, rapists and murderers and, and terrible, you know, people who've just done awful, awful things. And he said, you know, we have opposite jobs. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I represent bad people at their best and you represent good people at their worst. Mm. And he was absolutely right. And that is that, that it really brings out in people, divorce litigation really brings out in people just a, a, a brutal, you know, the, just the worst parts of many of them, not everyone, but many of them, high conflict divorces. And so I, I, I was a few minutes late for this. I'm never late for anything. I'm very proud of that. I'm one of those people that, you know, my father was in the military and I was raised with, uh, you know, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. Yeah. And, and I have to tell you, I, I, I got an emergency call from, from a client saying, um, essentially, 
Um, I don't want him to have his visitation this weekend. And this call came at about 3.50 and his visitation begins at 4 p.m. And I said, well, why? And she said, well, because of the coronavirus. And I said, well, look, this isn't a rapidly evolving you know, situation. And I understand that. But what's going on? Is someone in his home infected or in his community affected? And she said, well, he lives in Brooklyn and there is at least one confirmed case in Brooklyn. And I live in, in outside of the city and there's no confirmed cases in my area. So I propose that rather than have our daughter for the weekend, that he should come to my home and visit her. So I said, well, if what I understand you're doing is what you're saying is that he may have been exposed to coronavirus, so your daughter shouldn't go to his home. And instead, he, having been potentially exposed to coronavirus, should come to your home and your community, which is free from coronavirus, and potentially spread coronavirus to your home and community. Is that essentially what you're saying? <laughs> and she said, well, oh yeah, I guess that wouldn't be a great idea. I said, no, that, that wouldn't be a great idea. That would actually be a colossally bad idea. And although I get paid sometimes to say outrageous things to people in black robes with a straight face, I don't know that I could pull that one off. I said, what we should do, if this is really a concern to you, and I'm neither an epidemiologist nor a physician, is we should propose to him that he can have makeup visitation. We should say this is a rapidly evolving situation. I'm concerned about having our daughter even leave the house, essentially, unless necessary. So why don't we offer him makeup visitation for once this blows over, hopefully soon? And uh, she said, well, no, I don't, I don't want to give him makeup time. I said, so essentially, you just want to take the time away and not offer him anything more. And she said, all right, well, I guess I could offer him makeup time. So then I had to call his lawyer. And, and explain this in, in much more flowery terms and essentially say, look, will this guy just be willing to take makeup time instead? And uh, of course, you know, elephants don't marry zebras. His response was absolutely not. I want my child, you know, brought to my residence. So uh, opposing counsel and I just both went, you know what, I, I, we, what can we do with these people? There, there's not much we can do, you know, they're, 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 they're going to have to comply with the court order and he's entitled to his visitation. And if she doesn't bring the child, she'll Potentially, there'll be a violation petition against her. But I think the situation's so bizarre right now out there that I don't know that a judge would necessarily penalize someone, or maybe they would. I, I really don't know. But this is the kind of stuff, Rob, that, that being a divorce lawyer, anything that happens in the world, people will find a way. Like to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. You know? And to a person who wants to just fuck with their ex, they, they are going to find do it. some way to make anything that happens in the world, something they can fuck with their ex over. You know, one of the things I always wonder, like I'm think I'm having this vision in my mind of you talking to the other attorney, you guys, you know, you're an, you're intelligent man. You're, oh, you're yeah. detached emotionally from it. Do you ever have the conversation with the other attorney? Like she's fucking crazy. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, what do you, like, I, like, what do you want? I got on the, like, I have to make <laughs> <laughs> well, what you, what you do is you realize there are lawyers you can speak that way to. And by the way, those are the best of my adversaries. I mean, the best of my adversaries, we are great at, we're like boxers. We beat the shit out of each other all day long. But at the end of the day, we have a lot of respect for each other. There's no animosity between us. When we speak to each other, we speak candidly and we can say, look, you know what? I need you to, to get your client to do A, B, and C. Why? Because my fu client's fucking crazy and I really, really go a long way. And all right, well, let me talk to my client, see what I can do. And, and the truth is, is that like the upper echelon of divorce lawyers, particularly in New York City, we're kind of like, you know, like the matrimonial mafia. We're like the five families, you know, like we need <laughs> each other and we, we're at each other. We're fighting each other constantly. We're trying to take each other apart constantly. But at the same time, we kind of need each other. And so, you know, I, I, we have a respect for each other and it can be a real shorthand because there are, there are lawyers, you know, that are, that are similar to me in terms of their practice and, and their longevity in the field. And we can call each other and say like, look, this is like that other case we had where you were arguing the exact opposite of what you're arguing now. So why don't we just cut to the chase and do A, B, and C? And, and, you know, a lot of times it can really save people time and money. If the worst divorce lawyers are the ones who drink the Kool-Aid and who become aligned with their client emotionally. And they say, you know what, I'm going to fit my client with a halo and the other side with horns. And then it turns into like a turf war. The best thing you can do is 
advocate very hard for your client, but but do it in a way that's realistic and, and candid and you know moves the case forward. You know, I think the more that you emotionalize issues as a professional, the the the, the worse off you are. And 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 crazy just breeds more crazy. But there's a lot of lawyers out there that they really, like I said, they drink the Kool-Aid and, and you can't talk to them. You can't talk to them like a rational adult. Um, you have to be in advocacy mode a hundred percent of the time. And that's a really counterproductive thing sometimes. You know, in doing research for this, one of the things I came across is an interview that you did with, uh, not an interview, um, I don't know what to call it. You were a bartender on Andy Cohen's Watch What Happens oh, yeah. Live. Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to say it because I don't know what the hell, I mean, like you played a starring role. I don't know what to say, but yep. you know, first of all, I think Andy is amazing and the brand that he's yeah, created yeah. is just phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. How did that kind of thing fall in your lap? And what yeah. was that like for you? Well, I live, you know, I live in Manhattan. I practice in Manhattan. And, um, you know, when the book came out, it, it, it thankfully did very well. And um, there were a lot of TV appearances. I, I did 13 segments on Steve Harvey's show. Uh, it was supposed to just be a one-time appearance. And, and the audience reaction was so positive on social media and everywhere else that we turned it into a segment called How to Stay Married with James Sexton. And um, that actually parlayed into the, the, to the book How to Stay in Love. But essentially, you know, when you do one TV appearance, you know, people see you and, and then there's, you know, the word spreads and that's, you know, that, that turned into appearances on Rachel Ray and it turned into appearances on other things. But the Andy Cohen thing, you know, anytime there's somebody being buzzed about in a small enough way that it's not like a lead role, but a big enough way that it's making some kind of splash either in Manhattan or nationally, they'll say to you, do you want to come over and be the bartender? And, uh, you know, it's a couple blocks from my apartment. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll stay up past eight o'clock to do that. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, Andy was super gracious. Um, I'll tell you the truth. I was, I was shocked because I'm not, I don't watch those real housewife shows on Bravo yeah. um, because I spend all day with like crazy divorcing people. Like, the last <laughs> right, I would right. Fun. But I had watched enough of the real housewives of New York to think that Ramona, who was on the show that night was going to be kind of crazy. And when I met her, she could not have been nicer, sweeter, more articulate, and lovely. So I, it tells me something about the editing of reality television. And Ryan uh, Serhan, uh, who was the other guest that night for Million Dollar Listing, yeah. um, we ended up chatting after, and he ended up selling my apartment for me, my last apartment. Are you apartment. kidding me? Yeah, he came over to my apartment, because I said to him as I was leaving, I said, you know, do you actually do the realtor thing, or is this just like you're on TV now? And he said, no, I love it. This is what I do. And I said, look, I, I got to sell my place in, in Chelsea, and I'm looking to move into another place in Chelsea. And he said, uh, yeah, call me. here's my cell phone. Call me tomorrow. I called him the next day. The next evening, he was at my apartment and listed it and sold it very quickly for me. And I was, I was thrilled with him, thrilled with his whole team. So I, it's very funny how, you know, we see these people on the screen and we, you know, we kind of fetishize them or think like they're an other, they're not people. But, but the truth is, these are all just people. Like when Ryan and uh, Andy and I were chatting backstage, we were chatting about where we work out in the city. You know, and like where we, you know, which class is good and which thing we like to do and which CrossFit gym is good. And it was, it was very, uh, it was, it was very amazing when you meet these people that you only know through the screen, you know? That's amazing. I had, uh, I was in somewhere in Beverly Hills having lunch and Ramona was sitting next to me with uh, three or four of the other ones. Yeah. And we just struck up a conversation and she was really nice. You know, it was, uh, you're right. She was very different. So editing definitely has a lot to do yeah. with it for sure. What I was surprised about with her too is like I had my book and, and they take pictures backstage in front of like the Bravo banner. And yeah. uh, they said, oh, you know, can, let's get pictures of the three of you as the guests tonight. And I said, oh, yeah, great. And Ramona goes, oh, Jim, you know, get your book. Make sure you have your book. You're holding your book. And it hadn't occurred to me, you know, because I wasn't like, listen, the, the book and the TV stuff, all of it is really my job is, is I'm a divorce lawyer. I love what I do. This really was just using some different muscles in my brain writing the book. I've been, I've been a trial lawyer for 20 years. I love it. By Sunday afternoon, I can't wait to get back to work. But the truth is, is, you know, I just was inspired to just do something a little different, just to, to, you know, live a little harder, do something a little bit different. And, and I, uh, I started, you know, I, I'd heard an interview with Stephen King and he said, uh, they said to him, how are you such a prolific writer? You've written like 40 books. And he said, well, if you write a page a day in a year, you have a book. And I thought, well, let me test that theory. You know, I get up at 4am every day and the gym doesn't open sometimes till five. So let me, you know, see if I can write a page a day. And, you know, six months later I had a book and, and, wow. and so, it really, I'm not in the business of marketing a book. So having someone like Ramona, 
take the time to say like, oh, no, no, when you're getting your picture taken, make sure you have your, you're holding your book. You know, I thought, wow, you know what? That's a really kind thing to do. It's a really focused and, and, and you know, uh, empathetic thing to do. And I just was impressed with that, especially because, like I said, she's edited to be this like crazy person, you know? So um, I, I really do think that, that, you know, the image we see of people on TV versus who they actually are is probably very different. What was it about choosing to practice matrimonial law that was so clear from you right out of law school? You know, it's very funny. I, for me, I, I never wanted to do anything but matrimonial law. And the reason was that I really see the ending of a relationship, particularly a marriage, as an incredible opportunity for self-growth. I, I wanted to be a therapist. My undergraduate degree was in psychology. And I was fairly certain I wanted to be in mental health. Because I, I really do love sort of redemption arcs and, and, and stories of transformation have always inspired me. You know, when I was a kid, I always loved any of those films that had like the hero's journey, you know, like Karate Kid or, you know, any of the things that like a person is weak and they become stronger or a person faces adversity and it looks like it's an impossible situation and they found within themselves a strength to be something and to recreate themselves in their life. And that those narratives inspired me from, from a very young age. And, and being a therapist struck me as a way to do that. But my gift has always been one of persuasive speech. I was a debater in high school. I, I have a gift of gab, if you couldn't tell. And I really felt like being a therapist, a lot of what you have to do is listen. And a lot of what you have to do is, is, is process what the person's saying and, and help them find the tools to improve their own state of affairs. And as a lawyer, you get to go in and be someone's voice because we're not all gifted with the ability to extemporaneously speak. And so I, I thought, you know what, this is the best use of my gift is to be able to accomplish that thing, to help someone go through this transformative time to, to take, you know, the barn is burned down and now I can see the moon where the roof used to be, you know? And to me, it felt like, like in an increasingly curated world where all anyone does is put on their Instagram how happy they are and how rich they are and how beautiful they are and feel, you cannot pretend you meant to get divorced. You, you just can't. You can't fake it. Like you, you can't say, oh yeah, when we got married, I, I, I planned to get divorced. It's this raw reality that a person has to confront and say, no, I, I, I fell down. You know, and maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's their fault. Maybe it's everybody's fault or nobody's fault, but I, but it didn't go the way I thought it would. Now what? And the now what is what fascinates me. And being part of the architecture of that for people was and remains to this day for me the, the absolute coolest thing about my job is that I get to go in and fight and advocate to, to create conditions for people to build something new of their lives. And that to me feels, it, it's still humbling to, to be able to do that. I love it. All right. So let's back up a little bit and pull on that thread uh, with couples. What is likely going on with couples before you get the call? For example, I often hear people say, you know, my husband or my wife one day woke up and they said they didn't want to be married. Yeah. When you hear that, yeah. What's going through your mind or how do you think about that? Well, I think about it the way, you know, Tom Wolf in the book, The Bonfire of the Vanities, one of the characters is talking to one of the others and says, um, the, the character just declared bankruptcy. And he says, um, how did you go bankrupt? And he says, well, the way everyone goes bankrupt, very slowly and then all at once. <laughs> and, and I think that's how marriages end. I think that they end very slowly and then all at once. And I'm part of the all at once. But the very slowly, you know, no single raindrop's responsible for the flood. And, and I think what happens is relationships are about connection. And, and, and we, slow, we very rapidly connect, right? Love is, it hits us fast, it hits us hard, um, it hits us like a ton of bricks. And then I think we slowly disconnect. And, and then the slow disconnections lead to big disconnections or big moments that lead to the big disconnection. So, you know, somebody comes in and says, I, I want a divorce because my husband's fucking his secretary, or I want a divorce because I just found out that my wife depleted all of our bank accounts secretly and, and ran up $50,000 on credit card debt. That's not the underlying problem. That's the symptom of the problem. That's the proof positive of the problem. That's the, that's the tumor, you know, like that's the yep. undeniable. But the truth is, is, is there were problems in that relationship before. And, and what I occurred to me and, and inspired the book was the concept that 
if we could fix those small disconnections before they led you to my office, we would, we would get somewhere. You know, that it's a whole lot easier. My sister's a dentist, and she always says to me, by the time you have a toothache, it's too late. You know, people come to her and they have a toothache. And she's like, there's all I can do now is fill the cavity, pull the tooth, give you a root canal. She's like, if you came to me before you had a toothache, there's a lot I can do. There's a lot I can tell you habit wise that you're never going to have that toothache. But by the time you got the toothache, it's, it's pretty far gone. And I think by the time people are cheating, by the time people are, you know, just fully disconnected. It's, it's like, look, it's like fitness, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to maintain a healthy weight than it is to, to gain a tremendous amount of weight and then try to lose it. And so I'm just trying to teach people in relationships, learning from the examples of my clients, how do you stay connected and how do you keep those small connections from falling apart that ends up leading you to my office? You know, the tumor example that you gave is such a perfect example, but I do have a question about the symptoms which is infidelity. What percentage of the people that come to you have some sort of infidelity um, in their case? I would say a good 95%. It's a okay. it's tremendous. And I think that's a function of, of the human need for connection. And I think that we, 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 you know, when we disconnect from our spouse, that, that energy has to go somewhere. And there's only so long you can put it into your work or to the gym or to your kids or to, you know, other things. Eventually it finds its way to a romantic partner. And, and I think that's a very human, I mean, it's the same reason, you know, everyone's fascinated by the statistic that 53% of marriages end in divorce, which is a big number. You know, if I, you know, and then think about, you know, how many people, stay together for the kids or because they don't want to give away half their stuff. So now you're looking like, what, another 20%? So if I told you there's a 73% chance when you leave your house today, you're going to get hit in the head with a bowling ball, you wouldn't go out. You would stay in or at least wear a helmet. But people still get married. The more fascinating statistic to me, though, is that 87% of people who get divorced are remarried within five years of their divorce. Whoa. So think about that. Like now you've been through a divorce, you see how difficult that disconnect, even a friendly divorce, my own divorce was very friendly. It's still painful. It's still hard. And yet you go and, and you do it again. And that tells me the same thing that the infidelity statistic tells me. And that is how much we viscerally know we need connection with another person. We need another person to see our blind spots. We need another person to help us come, us, come into the fullness of ourselves. You know, and I think there's something biological in us that wants to pair bond. It, want, it wants to find that, you know, and, and that to me, that's something powerful that we should all be leveraging. Do you think men and women cheat for different reasons? You know, th that's a great question. But what I'd say is, I think they cheat for different reasons in the specificity of what brings them to the cheating. Like, I think I know a lot of men who cheat because they're not getting sex. And, and they, they really want sex. And I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but, but I, I, I'm, dude, don't shoot the messenger. You know, I, I'm talking about what I see on my side of the desk here when I talk to, to, to thousands of clients over 20 years. Yep. Women cheat because they're not getting attention. They're not getting affection. They're not getting, they don't feel appreciated. I think those are maybe the same phenomenon though, because I think men interpret sex as, I, I still think you're handsome. I still find you desirable. You're still the coolest guy I know. Um, it's also a physical need, you know, the need for, for sex itself. Um, whereas women, I think it's those same needs. Like you're still beautiful. Like saying, telling a woman she's beautiful and having enthusiastic sex with a man, I think is, is a desire they both have for the same message, which is I want you to want me. I want you to be impressed by me. I want you to cheer for me. So I think it's, it's the same reason, but manifesting in a different need, a different stated need. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking at the end of the day, if, you know, if it's no fault, like in a state like New York, which I think is no fault, right? You are, yep. Okay. So if it's no fault, you can only split the kid up so much, right? 50 here, yeah. 50 there, whatever it is. Yeah. You, the assets, you're splitting 50-50. Yep. Most of this has already been explained. Most people understand it. Why are people going so crazy with that? I want you to see this text. I want you to look at this photo. I, I, I hired an investigator and he followed him. Like, where is this crazy coming from? To what end? Is it just 
vengeance or like what's happening? You know, it's a great question, Rob. And, and I'll, there's a great book by Thane Rosenbaum called The Myth of Moral Justice, Why Our Legal System Fails to Do What's Right. And Thane was a professor of mine at Fordham Law School. And what Thane talks about in that book, and I would agree with it as an answer to your question, is that we have a need to tell our story, that, that there's a, a need in people to be heard. Um, that, that, you know, he talks a lot about the, uh, uh, commission on fellowship and reconciliation, which uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, or if any listeners aren't familiar with it was, was the, the government, uh, commission put together after apartheid ended in South Africa. I mean, we had a situation in South Africa where African-American neighbors were essentially, you know, subjected to poverty and slavery by white neighbors. And suddenly they said, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, so now you guys are equals. And it's like, well, how do we do that? Like, how do we reconcile the fact that my next door neighbor was racist to me for the last 20 years and and now we're equals? And what they did is they allowed people who'd been victimized by that system to get up and tell their story. And, and and, And they allowed people who had victimized others to get up and to talk about that experience, why they did what they did, why they shouldn't be viewed as evil people because they participated in a racist system. And and what Thane's preposition is, and I happen to agree with it, is that people have a need to be heard. You know, clients very often, they tell me a lot of extraneous information that has no legal value. And they, they just want someone to hear them. They want to feel that there's some sense of justice. And part of justice is is, is having your spouse hear the ways you hurt them, you know, or they hurt you. And, and so I, I think it's the wrong forum for it. I, I really do think that finding your quote unquote vengeance in the court system is a very expensive way of doing it. But it's the only way you can force your soon-to-be former spouse to be in a room with you. You can't force someone to come to therapy. You can't force someone to sit with you for an hour and listen to, to the ways that they hurt you. I, you know, one of the things I suggest in my book when people get divorced is to write their ex-spouse a letter, if they have, especially if they have children together, where they say, and I, I modeled it you know, after my own divorce. You know, I, I married my college sweetheart. We were 17 when we met. Um, we, we divorced. We had two young kids, seven and nine years old at the time. And now they're, now one is 22 and in law school and the other one's 20 and in college. And, you know, we had a very friendly divorce. We just, we just had become different people. We spent a lot of years kind of like two people running a daycare facility together with our two children. But we, we kind of sat down and said, look, I'm not happy. You're not happy. You know, we got to find another path. And, and thank God we, we had a wonderful co-parenting relationship. I'm very proud to say she's one of my dear friends. She's remarried to a wonderful guy who I consider a dear friend. And, and our, my sons have, if anything, a bizarre perception of how d- divorced couples are because they, they, you know, they would meet school chums when they were like 10 and 11 and they'd say, oh, my parents are divorced. And my sons would say, oh, mine are too. They're like, does your dad have a key to your mom's house? And he like feeds her cats when she goes on vacation with her boyfriend. <laughs> and they were like, no, they hate each other. You know, we would go to parent-teacher conferences and they would say like, the teachers would be like, you guys are divorced. Like you're, you're, you seem like your friends. And you know, the truth is, is she's one of my favorite people in the world, you know? Uh, but, but the truth is, is I, I did write her a letter. I don't think the letter was solely responsible for that relationship, but I did write her a letter saying, look, I, I wasn't great as your husband. You know, I wasn't the skill set of a husband. I'm not great at, you know, I, I, I'm not patient the way that I, I should have been. And I, you know, was very consumed with my work and the desire to build, you know, my professional practice and, and, you know, but, but here's what I can say. I, I'll, I'm going to be a really good ex-husband. I'm going to be really reliable and I'm going to be really consistent and I'm going to be a really good dad. I'm going to do my absolute best to be a really, really good dad. And I'm going to be a really good co-parent. And I'm really sorry for the ways that I failed you. And, and, and I want you to know that if sheer power of will could make two people be madly in love with each other. I'd be madly in love with you and you'd be madly in love with me. But, but I, you know, I, I want you to know to, to the extent that I know I have culpability for the way our relationship went off track. I want you to know how sorry I am for that. And I really believe that that kind of honest self, you know, assessment to a person who you've hurt intentionally or unintentionally is really valuable. And that's the, that's the same thing I think people are trying to force in court. They're hoping there's going to be someone in a black robe who's going to listen to the ways they've been hurt and look at the other person and say, did you hear that? 
you really should be ashamed of yourself how you behaved. You know, tell her you're sorry or tell him you're sorry. That day never comes, sadly. That day never comes. And I, I have to tell clients when they meet me, look, you're not going to have that moment. That moment may happen, by the way. You'll just never be there to see it. You know, your, your ex-spouse, I, I would probably bet, will be laying in their bed some night and will stop and think, you know, I behaved badly. Like, I shouldn't have done things the way I did them. I shouldn't have cheated on this person. Yeah, you know, it's not entirely my fault. You know, the relationship was falling apart and we weren't connected to each other. But I should have handled that differently. I should have sat her down and said, look, I'm really feeling disconnected to you before I started a new relationship, perhaps. And But you're not going to be there to see it. And they're not necessarily going to call you to tell you that. So don't go looking for that in the unified court system. You know, either either resolve it in your own head and say, okay, I have to have faith that this person, like me, like everyone, will have a quiet moment where they're going to reflect on their own behavior and be satisfied with that or just realize that's a need you have that's never going to be satisfied. Yeah, you, that letter that you wrote really sets the tone. I don't know if you like this word or not. Um, uncon- unconscious uncoupling, right? Is that what they? Yeah, is that what the kids are, call, kids are calling it these days? Yeah, that's what that's what the uh, that's what Gwyneth Paltrow called it, and everybody uh, jumped on it from there. So everybody jumped on. Well, it worked. Uh, it worked for her, yeah. and uh, I forgot Martin. his name. Yeah, Chris Martin. Chris Martin, yeah. In my experience, and you can tell me if this is your experience as well, but in my experience, just sort of like being around people who've gotten divorced and watched the shit show for, you know, the one or two years that they're going through it, if it's, you know, a a long one, usually two to three years later, they're cool. Yeah. But in your experience, do they eventually just chill out and go on with their lives and they're able to communicate and that heat subsides or do you generally see them just mad forever? So what I'll tell you is the overwhelming majority of people who get divorced, in my experience, that it's actually a, a fairly uh, routine and an almost business-like transaction. It really is just lawyers negotiating and, and working out details. You don't hear about those because they're not interesting. Like mm. if, you, if you said to me, so Jim, you got divorced. I want to hear all about it. My divorce is the least interesting thing about me. It, it, it really is such a banal tale to some degree. Like, you know, I loved this person when I was 17. We had a really good run for a good 10, 11 years. And then we parted as the close, you know, it's like the Billy Joel lyric. We parted the closest of friends and we stayed friends. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people I love. I wouldn't want to be married to. She's one of them. There's 7.3 trillion people in the world, billion people in the world. And, and, you know, there's a lot of them I love, but there's some that I don't think I'd be suitably married to. And she's one of them, but I love her and she loves me. So I, I think that, that you hear about knock down, drag out divorces. Look, as a divorce lawyer, people cannot, when I go to any kind of a party and they go, what do you do for a living? I'm a divorce lawyer. Oh my God, you must have some stories. And they don't want to hear a story about, yeah, you know, like there was this couple and they slowly grew apart and then they had a conversation about that and they decided that they were going to end things. So we helped them uh, divide uh, their deferred uh, retirement accounts and uh, offset from a tax perspective, their uh, pension plan versus the equity they had in their home. That's not an interesting story. You're going to fall asleep halfway through that story. You want to hear about the person who was having sex with the nanny and then got caught. And then the other spouse had sex with the nanny and left for the nanny. You know, that's the story you want to hear. So if you, the people who who talk about divorces are either people who've been terribly scarred by a long, brutal one or people who have really weird, outrageous divorces you know, those are the people that have divorces that are worth talking about. So, of course, everybody thinks that that's what divorces look like. But the overwhelming majority of divorces aren't like that. They're really like, you know, in a couple of years, the people look back at it and go, I mean, how do you look back on any of your ex-loves? You know, you look back on them and go, hey, we had some good times. We had some bad times. The good times hopefully stick out more in your head than the bad times. I know with every year that passed, I mean, memory is kind. You know, my, my mom passed away five years ago after a long battle with cancer. And I remember in the last months of her life, she was so, so ill. And I remember one of the saddest things for me was thinking, I'm never going to be able to see my mother in my memory the way she was when she was healthy and young and happy. And and I'm always going to remember this skeletal sick person who's been here for the last bunch of months. And I can tell you five years after her passing, I couldn't have been more wrong about that fear. Like, I, I don't remember that very well. I only really remember clearly 
her with a full head of hair, happy, smiling, warm glow. You know, and, and, and I think memory is kind. I think most women who've had a baby will tell you that for a couple of months after you've had the trauma of childbirth, you think, oh my God, I'm never doing that again. And then a year or two later, you go, oh, you know, maybe I'll have another baby. Like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Oh, remember how cute the baby was when they were born? And, and it's the truth. I mean, memory is kind. And, and, and there's no reason relationship memory shouldn't be kind as well. You know, I was, uh, I recently watched uh, Noah Baumbach's uh, marriage story. Oh, sure. And in prepping for this interview, I wondered what your take on it was when you saw it. So maybe you can kind of just yeah, unpack that. I mean, I got to tell you, like watching that movie in my free time again was, you know, it's it's like got to be how a stand-up comedian feels when someone's like, oh, can I tell you a joke? It's like, oh yeah, that's a real fucking <laughs> You're like, this is like, Tuesday. I, you know, that'll be a real treat. I haven't listened to jokes all goddamn day, you know? So, <laughs> right. uh, you know, I went home and I watched it and I, I thought they did a really good job of showing how two sane people who loved each other can be weaponized in some ways. But I think they put too much of it on the lawyers because, you know, they wanted to have compelling characters as, as you should in a, in a movie. But the Laura Dern character, the Ray Liotta character, the, the fact that they kind of amped up the aggression, it, it, it's not really accurate. I mean, most divorce lawyers, myself included, we're so busy. We have so much to do. The last thing, we're, our job is to put out fires. The last thing we want to do is throw gas on fires. We mm. tend to be the most rational people in the room. And we understand our desire to calm our client. The best of us, we really try to minimize how much money we make. I mean, it's one of the only businesses other than physicians where we're really trying to minimize how much billable fee there is in a case. And I'll say to clients all the time, they'll say, I want you to make this motion. And I'll say, look, I can make that motion. I'll make 20 grand on that motion. But I'm telling you, I don't think it's got a great chance of success. I don't think long-term it's the best path for you. And that's what good divorce lawyers do is we talk people out of things that are against their own self-interest. And so I thought that film, the, the biggest disservice it did was created this impression that divorce lawyers somehow are going to amp things up between people, you know, or you're going to get the Alan Alda character who's like this total mush pot, you know, and I, I just think that, that, you know, uh, caricatures or tropes to me are, are never good you know, and, and so to say, well, the mediator is going to be this wishy-washy, his first lawyer is going to be this wishy-washy guy, or it's a pit bull shark who's going to, I don't think it has to be that way. And I also, I, I think good divorce lawyers, we have a full toolkit. So if you ask someone about me, if you read reviews about me online, some of them will say, Jim is a courtroom sociopath. Jim is a pit bull off the leash and will tear your spouse to shreds on the witness stand. And some reviews will say, Jim is the most reasonable, conciliatory. He did not let the things get amped up. He made a point of keeping things friendly and reasonable. And they're both right. It's just a matter of the right tool for the right task. To suggest that a good divorce lawyer is going to be one or the other. This is the only job in the world, I'm fairly convinced, that people sit across from me in a consultation and say, I've heard you're a ruthless son of a bitch. And they mean that as a compliment. And that's why they're here. They're here because they heard I'm a ruthless son of a bitch. And the truth is, I, what I think they mean by that is I feel really unsafe and I need someone who's going to be really strong and aggressive for me when that's appropriate. And, and, and that's absolutely true about me. I, I will absolutely eviscerate someone on cross-examination if I have to. I will do what needs to be done um, because my, my, my clients' needs to accomplish the things that need to be accomplished in their case are greater, in my opinion, than my need to maintain moral purity. You know, my job is to do the best I can for my client, irrespective of motives. Is there ever a time when you're eviscerating somebody because you're you're like, this is what it yeah. this is what it needs? Like I'm pulling this out of the toolbox because this yeah. is this is where I need to apply the pressure. Yeah. Is there ever a time where you leave and you feel either sick to your stomach or bad or upset or like, oh, fuck, I, yeah. I looked in his eyes yeah. and I saw what I was doing to him and I feel sick. Did that ever happen or has yeah. that changed through That's the years? A great question. And, and I don't think it's one I've ever been asked. So I'll tell you, here, here's my thought. When I was a, I'm 47. And when I was a younger professional, I, I think the thrill of smelling blood in the water on cross-examination was, was everything to me. And, and I really was like a, a, a fighter 
who just sees red and just hits the person until they stop moving and just is so excited about the technique involved and the aggression involved and winning that, that, that it never touched me. I really would walk away from it and go, yep, I did my job. I did what I was supposed to do. I went in and I did what I do. How a soldier may feel, you know, look, my job was to kill those people and I killed them, you know, and, and I'm not the one who sent me, you know, it's like in gross point blank when John Cusack's character, the guy, he's an assassin in the story. And guy says to him, like, please don't do this. And he says, I don't have any problem with you, pal. And he shoots him, you know, because he's like, I'm, I'm not the one you got a problem with. It's whoever sent me, you know. And so yeah. my feeling is, I don't have a problem with you. My job is to tear you apart because that's what needs to be done in this case. I'm not the one you got a problem with. It's your spouse you got a problem with. It's too late, you know. But I will say to you that in the last 10 years or so, and I don't know if this is, you know, I used to be able to shovel snow and my back didn't hurt too. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if it's age or if it's maturity or if it's, a, 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 a you know, something else, but I, I definitely have had more moments now where I don't feel great about what I've had to do sometimes. I, I have a chapter in the book, um, where I talk about winning a case for a client who by any objective standard was one of the most morally horrible people I'd ever met. He was, he was a pimp. An actual pimp. I don't mean like he's a pimp. Like he was a pimp. Like that's what he did. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. He, he made money on on having women have sex with other people, and uh, in, in in addition to gun running and uh, and selling drugs, he's now in, been in federal prison for quite some time, uh, unrelated to anything I had to do with him. Uh, and and he uh, had uh, had children with one of uh, one of his uh, girls, as he called them. And um, we were in court because she had brought an order of protection proceeding against him, essentially uh, alleging that he had, had viciously beaten her. And um, the lawyer on the other side of that case was an extremely inexperienced attorney. I don't think she'd ever done a trial before. And I talk about in the book how I, I managed to win the case for him. And, and uh, because this lawyer just did not know how to get certain photographs into evidence, photographs of her battered face from when he had beaten her. And I was able to sustain objections um, that prevented those photos from getting in. And without the photos, they had no case. And it was purely because, you know, he had money and could hire me and she was poor and got a court assigned attorney who was brand new and had no idea what they were doing. And I walked out and as we were walking down the hall, uh, he laughed and he said to me, man, you know, and I'll never forget the phrase. He said, uh, one good lawyer is better than 20 stick up men. Mm. And it was one of the only times in my career and probably the first time in my career that I felt a real sense of, I should not have won. I should not have won that case. Like we mm. should not have a system where you can get as much justice as you afford. Um, and I should not, that lawyer, if they didn't know what they were doing, shouldn't have been in a courtroom. You know, they shouldn't have been charged with caring for this person's case if they didn't have the toolkit to take care of it the right way. So in that moment, yeah, I felt a real sort of sickness. But the majority of the time, elephants don't marry zebras. You know, like crazy marries crazy. Um, unreasonable behavior is often met with other unreasonable behavior. So it's it's really... I've, I've represented the cheater and the cheated. I've represented the substance abuser and the person married to the substance abuser. I've represented the person who said, help me, my spouse is hiding money. And the person who said, help me hide money from my spouse. And I got to tell you, you spend enough time with people you, you, and hear their story and you start to realize you know, what Solzhenitsyn said, which is that you know, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously doing evil things. But the truth is, is that the line of good and evil runs right through the human heart. You know, that we all have moments of, of, you know, real poor behavior and are the angels of our worst nature. And we have moments where we have the angels of our better nature. So I, but I, I do with increasing frequency have times where I feel it more than I used to when I'm representing someone or using my skills for, you know, evil rather than good. But I'll tell you, I, it doesn't, I never throw the game. You know, I've never ever been in a moment where I went, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to throw the game. I'm going to, I'm going to let that question go, or I'm not going to make that objection, or I'm not going to ask this question. I'm going to show mercy to this person. That's not my job. And I, I believe if you believe in democracy, you have to believe in the rule of law and in due process. And look, I will tell you, I'm a good lawyer, but you know, you can give the greatest chef in the world really shitty ingredients 
they're not going to be able to make you a perfect meal out of it. So if I have a client who comes in and they've got really bad facts because their behavior has been atrocious, there's only so much, you can put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig, you know? And and so I can make a, a bad case better, but I can't make a bad case good. You know, and 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 I can definitely take a good case and, and make it the best it could be. You know, so that's really where I find myself. I want to talk a little bit about sort of like what you do to release the stress valve. You know, <laughs> the pressure cooker that you're under. Yeah. What is it about competing in MMA that you love? Well, I I, I love martial arts and I love fighting. Um, I think fighting is the purest expression of, you know, conflict. And um, you're really fighting yourself always. You know, you're fighting your own limitations. Um, I, I love the adrenaline rush of, of competing and fighting. As I age, you know, it's harder and harder. I used to be better at getting punched in the face. Um, it's, it's a younger man's game for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, but I'll say that I, for me, there's no greater release than the physical release. I mean, I, I, I'm a lot like Lewis in the sense that we both love doing the cold plunge stuff and we both, um, really love, uh, a vigorous exercise, you know, uh, resistance training, cardio. And, and, and I happen to love Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, and mixed martial arts more than anything, because I, I do find that it's like human chess. I mean, fighting, fighting, whether I'm doing it in a courtroom or I'm doing it in a cage or on the Jiu Jitsu mat. Fighting is, is chess. It's just human chess. It's about anticipating the other side's move. We both know what, you know, with chess, we both know the moves. We both know what the other person's objective. And we are simultaneously trying to advance our strategy and thwart their strategy. And their, their strategy or their goal is the same as mine. They want to defend against my blows and they want to strike their own blows. And so I love that. There's something so honest about the fact that that we're going to both go in and we're going to both try to advance and defend at the same time. And I find that's for me, the greatest, you know, all of the things I enjoy are things where I'm challenging myself to push myself past my limits. I love, you know, cold water training. I I love ice, ice plunges, you know, trying to sustain the amount of time that I can be in an uncomfortable situation. I like being uncomfortable. I, I feel very alive when I'm uncomfortable. I think that I think we all start to die when we get too comfortable. So I, I feel like if you're uncomfortable, you're still alive. You know? Did you play uh, chess? I did. Yeah, I did. And I still do. It's interesting because you have this interesting mix of sort of like, you know, chess and debate and psychology yeah. and your ability to communicate. And you're also incredibly grounded with moral principles. And I, I'm starting to piece together how you wound up in the world that yeah. you're in, because this is your, you have a great self-awareness of what makes you tick. It's, it's tricky. I, I always tell young lawyers who work for me, because I, I hire a lot of young, smart and hungry people right out of law school, because I like to hire lawyers that, that don't have bad habits, that I'm just getting them clean and fresh and I'm teaching them, you know, the way to be matrimonial lawyers, at least the way that I like to do it. And I've had some amazing people come through my office and many of them have gone on to found their own firms or become partners in big firms. And I'm, I'm, I'm as proud of that as I am any case I've ever won for anybody. But, but I have to say that I tell all of them that you have to have a very defined sense of self to do what we do for a living because you're, you're, you're really, it is chess in the sense that, that um, you're constantly thinking about, okay, what is this move? What implications will it have on the next 10 available moves? And what is the other side's next move? And if I was them, what move would I make? And what moves will that eliminate my possibility of making and create the possibility for them to make. And I'll tell you very candidly, Rob, because because I, I, I think you've got the very candid version of me here. Um, th- that's wonderful in my professional life and very challenging in my personal life. Because in my personal life, I find as a parent, as a friend, as a romantic partner, I'm constantly thinking eight, nine moves ahead all the time. And I'm great at it. It's what's made me good as a lawyer is I can think eight, nine moves ahead. But there's a lot of parts of life I'm, I'm, I'm realizing as I'm solidly middle-aged where you don't always know what's going to happen eight, nine moves ahead. And even if you do, why skip to the end? Like, let it unfold. Let it unfold the way it's supposed to and be mindful in the moment of what's happening. Because... You know, every relationship, if we're honest with each other, you know, if you meet a, a beautiful woman, you know, like, you know, you, you look at your wife, like your, your marriage will end. It will end in death or divorce, but all marriages end. So do you at the beginning go, okay, well, you know, this thing's definitely going to end. Like it's going to either end in death or divorce. Or do you go, all right, we're here. We're, we're here now. We're together now. Let's be in that. And, and I have a very, because when you spend 12 to 13 hours a day thinking eight moves ahead, 
And then six, seven o'clock at night hits and everyone goes, okay, turn that off now. It's not that easy. And as a yeah, parent, but- it was hard. And as a, as a person with friendships and relationships, it's really, really hard. And my, my solution to it has always been to rely very deeply on the comfort of routines. Like I, people joke, I'd be the easiest person to assassinate because I do the exact same things at the exact mm-hmm. same time every single day. Got it. The predictability is is actually um, soothing for you in a Incredibly way. That, yeah, that makes that makes sense. What do people often get wrong about you? Uh, I think people think because of what I do for a living and the level at which I do it that I'm heartless um, or that I am not sympathetic. Um, I, I I think it's one of the things I laugh about in jujitsu is that you know it's it's brought me to a place where all of my best friends have tried to choke me to death, and and I think it's it's for a fighter you can beat the hell out of someone and have no animosity towards them because you're doing it in this confined, controlled environment and it's with their consent and with their encouragement, you know? And I think people think because I fight for a living, you know, and argue for a living that I'm an argumentative person. And the truth is, is in my my real life outside of the office, I'm the least argumentative. I'm so easygoing. I, I, I don't enjoy political debates. I don't enjoy you know, conflict really, because I get so much of it in my professional life that personally it's, it's just not appealing to me. And so I'm, I'm really level. I'm really quick to apology. I'm really quick to acknowledging my own culpability in anything that happens. So I I think a lot of people would think because of what I do for a living, that's, that's not how I'd be, but it's, it's actually exactly how I am. All right. As we uh, move towards wrapping, I'm going to ask you some questions that are going to seem like they're from left field. Just roll with it. Love it. <clears throat> what is the one goal that you thought, when I achieve this, everything in my life is going to be great? And then you got it. And you went, that just did not do what I thought it was going to do. Yeah. Having money. Having mm. money. I grew, up, I grew up without money. Um, I grew up in a house with a lot of economic instability, and um, my father was a Vietnam veteran, uh, an alcoholic, um, a, a good person. He did the best he could, um, but he he had a really hard time. Uh, now he's been he's been sober for several years now. I'm very proud of him, and uh, he's, he's we have a very close and loving relationship. But he had a really really hard time uh, when when guys came back from Vietnam. You know they didn't get the support that they needed, and that veterans hopefully get today. Um, so he he really struggled, and and it made in me. Uh, as many people who grow up with economic instability, I, I really thought money, if I had money, I'd have security, I'd have status, I'd have happiness. Um, I, I would just, money came to signify everything that I didn't have. And then I was successful in what I do for a living and I had money. And I realized what I believe is a fundamental truth about money, and that is that it, it offers you real solutions to imaginary problems and imaginary solutions to real problems. And I, I came to realize that although it's a wonderful thing to have money and, and being financially stable and successful is a, is a great thing, um, it was something I had put a lot of emotional significance on, and that wasn't the thing that gave me joy. The thing that gave me joy was having a task that I was good at and a skill and having a place to be where I was an instrument being put to its purpose. And and, Mm -hmm. and it wasn't the money. The money was an ancillary product of it. And and in my own son's lives, I've encouraged them always to just find something you love and do it passionately and deeply. Do not be the kind of person that spends, you know, five days a week looking forward to two. Mm. If you could spend one month anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Oh, that's a great one. Uh, I would probably go. Uh, I have a property in uh, Saint Nazaire in the Medoc, which is about an hour and a half outside of Bordeaux in France, and it's an uh, old building that um, I've been renovating for a number of years. It's a small wine country kind of town, a bit like Northern mm-hmm. California, yeah. um, but it's it's got a it's got a very uh, a French sort of sensibility. But it's like living in a country area, and I've spent a couple of weeks there at a time. And every time I'm there, I always think, "Boy, I, I can't wait to retire here someday." So I, I think uh, if I could just put my life on pause and be there for a month right now, and, and come back and not have all of my clients' cases have exploded, um, I think that would be where I would be. It's a slower lifestyle. It's it's you know beautiful, simple food. Uh, beautiful countryside, great weather. It's like Northern California weather. And uh, I think that would be my idea of heaven for a little while. Mm, God, that sounds good. Yeah, if you could is. only go to one restaurant before you die, where would your last meal be? 
wow, you know, I like to eat. Um, I, I, I exercise in part because how much I like to eat. Yeah. I, I have to say, um, gosh, that's a really tough question, but I think my, my favorite restaurant and where I would want my sort of last meal is, is I, I, I've been to some amazing places. I've been to the French Laundry. I've been to Le Bernardin. I've been to, you know, per se. I've been to some really high-end, amazing restaurants. I've been to some amazing restaurants in different countries. I would probably say, though, that I would go to a, a diner, <laughs> a diner in, in, in Jersey, uh, and, and uh, have a burger. I have a really good, you know, uh, grilled hamburger with a bun and with a pickle on it. And, uh, on some fries with gravy on the side. I think that if I had to have a death row meal, it would be that or fried chicken, like good fried chicken made in somebody's kitchen who knows how to make it. Um, <laughs> because there's something about, you know, that kind of rustic comfort food that to me is just the best thing in the world. It's, it's way better than any tasting menu at the finest restaurant. I get it. I grew up in Queens. I totally understand. There you go. It. I mean, like a good slice. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, I, I do. Not too hot. You know, like just throw it in the oven for a second. Give it to me like that. You kind of can't beat that. You know? No. Nope. No, nope, I love it. Okay, so the rapid fire round. Answer as quickly or as slowly as you like. It's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Round. What would your friends say is one of your superpowers? Uh, when everybody else is panicking, I turn into like Neo from the matrix and everything <laughs> slows down and I'm really, I'm great in chaos. I, I tell people I'm great in chaos and I have no idea what to do with myself in, 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 in stability. I, I, uh, I'm way better in a courtroom than in my living room. So I, I, I would say my superpower, anyone who knows me would say when shit hits the fan, Jim's the guy you call. And when things are like calm and stable, Jim has no idea what to do with himself. What keeps you up at night? Uh, right now, coronavirus. Uh, no, what, what keeps me up at night? I would say yeah. um, not a lot keeps me up at night. I sleep, I sleep really well. I go to bed at like 8 o'clock, 8.30 every night because I wake up at 4 a.m. So I, I sleep really well. I don't, I, don't, I don't worry too much about things. I, I believe in the old adage that worry is uh, interest paid on uh, problems that are not yet due. You know? What book have you reread the most? Oh, wow. Uh, I love the book No Country for Old Men by Cormac McCarthy. I think it's a great story and it's got a lot of great narratives about good and evil. And um, for nonfiction, uh, Josh Waitzkin's book, The Art of Learning, I think is one of the best books out there and it has a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount of value for anybody who wants to learn about how to learn and how to approach new subjects and old subjects. Um, as an aside, Tim Ferriss just interviewed him um, yes, last I week. To it. Oh, I love Did you it. listen to it on the on foiling the surfing yeah. thing? Well, I, I train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at Josh's Academy. Josh is the co-owner of the Marcelo Garcia Academy in Manhattan. Ah. I had the pleasure of, of meeting Josh a bunch of times, and uh, Tim and Josh uh, have a long-standing friendship. And Josh is is just a fascinating human being. I mean, he was the basis for searching for Bobby Fischer, and 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 you know, he's a chess prodigy. And but but he is. Um, an amazing example to me. If, if, if I was to say that there's someone who I, I look at and genuinely admire the manner in which they've used the gifts they have, but also managed their day-to-day -day life, um, he is excellent at it. He is, that is a person who has a very defined sense of who they are and who they're not and is, is really unapologetic about living his life the way he lives it. And I, I really admire that about him. And he's got really great jujitsu too, so... He's one of the most introverted, articulate guys that I've ever he heard. Is, really, he has so really much amazing. to share, and getting him to talk is hard. And, and, and it's the opposite of me in the sense that it's so easy to get me to go and go and go verbally. And yet sometimes I'd be much better off just shutting up for a second. And Josh, <laughs> Josh has this ability to just create space for things to happen and for yeah. ideas to flourish. And I think it's why he and Tim actually are such an amazing pairing, in my opinion, because Tim is so good at getting information out of people and, 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 and speaking himself, you know, and he has so much to say in such a point of view. And Josh has an incredible point of view and so much knowledge, but is reluctant to get out there like some kind of gospel preacher and sort of preach the gospel of Josh. And Tim has this ability to pull, you know, pull him into the dialogue. And every time those guys sit down, anytime anyone sits down with Josh, it's fascinating. But anytime Josh and Tim sit down, I think it's their third or fourth time sitting down on his podcast. It is just gold. I, I listen to it sometimes two, three times.
Yeah, really, really good. Okay, last two questions. If uh, if you had to give a TED Talk on nothing that you're known for or nothing that you speak about, so we're going to take uh, divorce and firearms and jujitsu and chess, all the stuff that we talked about. If you had to give a TED Talk on nothing that you speak about, but it could be on anything else that you have a passion for, what would it be? <sighs> wow. Um, I think it would be about anger. I think it's tangentially related to divorce, but I think it, I would probably give a TED talk about how to talk to someone who's angry. I, mm. I think that it's something we don't learn. We don't learn how to fight verbally, and we don't learn how to argue, and we don't learn how to deal with someone who wants to argue with us, and how to how to take their their anger and frustration and channel it the right ways. And I think that 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 would be a really useful TED Talk to talk about how to understand someone's anger and how to redirect it the right ways. You know, Voss, uh, uh, who wrote uh, Never Split the Difference, um, uh, the hostage negotiator for the FBI for a long time, um, he talks a lot about this subject without talking about it directly. He talks a lot about the idea of how to um, you know, how, how to redirect someone's aggression. And I think it would be, that'd be a fun TED talk to give. That's a beautiful answer. There are, uh, there are two people I've done over 200 interviews. Now there are two people that took me on a ride in the way, you know, when you go see a comedian, like if you go see Joe Rogan or something where like you can suspend your mind for a minute and you can give it to him and have him take you on a ride. Yeah. Um, there are two people, interviews that I've done where I had that experience, that out-of-body experience. One is Chris Voss and the other is you. You both oh, have the yeah. ability to just take you on a mental ride yeah. that you're just, you, you know, you're like, you're like Aladdin. Yeah. <laughs> you're just sitting on that carpet. Yeah. Last question I have for you. Um, we're going to change things up a little bit. What one question would you like to ask me? Gosh. I actually have a lot of questions I'd like to ask you. I, I, uh, uh, if I get to ask one, I would ask you, you know, of, of the things, because you're someone who, who I, I'm fascinated by, you have a thirst for all of this information.